Alrighty, let's let me find the right screen. <laughs> Take it, RJ. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we're back again. I must apologize for a brain fart last week because I completely neglected to mention all of the part two of the show uh, in any great detail, which had to do with Denise O'Leary, who was channeling Granville Sewell, who was channeling, uh, channeling uh, Matty uh, Lasola. Uh, attacking Nick Matsky on the origin of carnivorous plants. Is that a, a daisy chain or what? Uh, anyway, it was a bad move on their part uh, doing this now because there were a bunch of technical papers uh, on the evolution of carnivorous plants and bladder warts and all the rest that was apparently resolving the thing that supposedly wasn't resolvable. And so anyway, I, got, I had a whole bunch of links and stuff on that. So uh, for those who dived into that, uh, there it was. Um, and as usual, um, the evolution keeps on moving on and the people who don't do the work keep on trying to pretend it isn't and by not studying any of it. So go figure. Anyway, um, as threatened and promised, we have been diving into the new uh, 2017 source, uh, a book that uh, source analysis that we're doing, replacing Darwin, the new origin of species by Nathaniel Jensen, who plays an odd role in modern young earth creationism uh, because he's um, kind of a waffler on a lot of subjects, including arguing that, that creationists have always accepted transitional forms Oh, <laughs> no, they haven't. <laughs> so he's in a kind of a little oddball spot in there. But anyway, um, this one is kind of funky uh, because it launches right off the bat, off the deep end. Uh, as I mentioned previously, there's no index. Uh, there's no reference bibliography. There are footnotes. So basically, if you were trying to find out topics and issues, it wouldn't be easy to find that. Why do you do a science book where it's hard to find the science? Is that suspicious or not? So um, I'm just starting right at the beginning and see what I'm doing. So um, uh, we're starting off with the introduction, which is basically a, 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 an acceptance that there was a sea change in the 19th century as they started finding more species. And this Darwin guy came along and came up with speciation and all that. Uh, by natural selection, and um, mentions Paley's watch argument and so forth and so on, not really dealing with the issue that the Bible didn't really conceptualize speciation and the Bible deemed fixed species. Uh, but the, the part, part where he uh, actually climbs into some source to check was a statement, if you move south to warmer climates, bears, foxes, and rabbits lose their white coats in favor of something more suitable. Footnote four. Now that's actually a perfectly innocuous statement. Uh, nothing particularly controversial about it until you look at the source material, which I put the links up to in the uh, course description, uh, perfectly fine stuff on foxes and bears. They don't make any discussion of latitudinal gradients on coloration, though. <laughs> In other words, they're not documenting the point he's trying to make. And so anybody can look through them to find out uh, the, the, the uh, bear issue just alludes in passing to um, uh, bears that live in the Arctic, uh, but it's not their main point, and they're not really discussing anything about their cult. It's, it's about um, their uh, whether or not they're ecologically threatened or not. So it's an odd source base to deal with the issue that he's bringing up. Why is he bringing up something that's kind of off in the corner? <laughs> so that's, um, that's raising my little antennae to be wary as I move on into the rest of the material uh, because um, it's highly likely that he's doing that with everything. And we already knew from the book Jackson Wheat and I have written, which I will wave in front of you audience again. It's great big thick monstrosity here. The rocks were there, volume one hundreds of pages. We uh, go into Jensen, uh, Tompkins, and the various other groups. Uh, for those of you who are unaware of Nathaniel Jensen uh, in terms of the play role he's playing in modern creationism, um, he's part of that little narrow cluster with Tompkins and Sanford and others who are trying to kind of end run genetically and biologically to argue that everything is only 6,000 years old and 4,500 years since the flood-ish. 
and that therefore there's been a degeneration and all the kinds make sense and so forth and so on. That's not going to be an easy argument to make. <laughs> and um, uh, we'll be following up on all of that material as we continue into it. Um, the, the secondary topic we'll be waiting, uh, Jackson should be along in, in due course and he can give us updates on the various things we're doing. I'm, I've finally got my backlog of source material to plug into my reference field following up on the tip work, which I do keep track of, which is keeping track of all the different anti-evolution uh, sources and what technical literature they cite and it gradually gets bigger and bigger and bigger and I keep on expanding that. Um, so I had a big backlog that kind of went on hold uh, while I was finishing off the book with Jackson, but now I can start getting back to that. And then with that out of the way, uh, can then move on to resuming the writing for volume two. Uh, hi, Tornado. Hello. Yes, hello, hello, hello. it was ironic uh, to be involved with Psy Strikes um, movie night. Uh, that was earlier in the day for a change so that Europeans could see it without having to be up in weird hours. And uh, they, they were happened to be looking at a video that was a climate denialist, uh, climate change denialist oh, thing. Oh, and that was right oh, up. RJ, okay. RJ, you're, you're forgetting yep. the two other parts, including the best part. He was also a young Earth creationist. Oh, yeah. And a dinosaur denier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a trifecta of, of uh, students. Mother so he was actually... Fucker. Yeah, he was, um, uh, he, you only discovered, he was basically attacking Leonardo DiCaprio and pub public figures. Uh, I think this was like 2014 or something like that. It was a way back on, on the video. And of course, he said Communist United Nations. Oh, yeah, yeah. So he was a bundle of warning signs. But when he finally acknowledged that he thinks the Earth is only some 6,000 years old and that dinosaurs weren't even real, uh, he, uh, he jumps My outburst off. was like, oh, sh and basically... <laughs> Mama Atheist got a taste of the tornado house outburst. Yeah, he um, he illustrates uh, the perfectly fine example of what goes on in grassroots creationism in the Kent Hovind world and people. I didn't who are know below. there was such thing as grassroots creationism. All I thought it was. Open oh yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, is somebody is somebody scraping a? a... <laughs> oh yeah, you're having some mic issues, tornado. Oh yeah, that's me when I. When I move my knees, it kind of moves the microphone. It's oh oh, it's amputate your knee. Goal. Get rid of that. Yeah, no way needs knees. Not it's anymore. My, it's my um, You're a chair people it's now. It's my shit mic for now. It's going to be this way for a while. So, uh, uh, ah, well, the old one died. Mute when necessary. Explodey, so I'm stuck using this piece of shit headset. Yeah. Uh, grassroots creationists are the ones who are out in the hinterlands. They may have seen an article on an, a website. They may have read a creationist book, although these days it's more likely that they'll be watching a creationist video. Uh, they're hyper conservative, hyper religious, um, and have their little axes to grind and may have a MAGA hat on. And uh, that's below the May. people who are um, professional creationists who okay, do it for so, a living. Um, I'm being handed the other headset, and this is Mom Nato. Hello. No, oh, Lisa, for truth, asked, do you think a COVID will get rid of Kent for us? Oh, that would be amusing and ironic, but I wouldn't bet on it. <laughs> uh, no, the, the apricot seeds will. Mom missed the fun. No. <laughs> Mom's had a rough day. Oh, my. Old Scratch says, rocks are somehow both amazing and boring at the same time. I hope you're referring to Rocks Rocks and not our book. <laughs> the, um... Oh, and Lisa says they still haven't defined kind. Yeah, that's that's don't look for them. Well, they define it in a perfunctory way. There's a, 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 effectively it's things that will interbreed. And when you ask a Kent Hovind, they'll proceed on the fact, well, you know, dogs make dogs, don't they? And is this any better? Oh, it sounds oh, yeah. like it. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Quick note, very important. Uh, Lavender Lady says, hi, Mom Nato. Yes. And Old Scrad says, Kent is social distancing on his commune. <laughs> will do. Yes, basically, oh, Mom Nato has officially appeared on Evolution Hour ish. And, and C Brown says, I sure could use a nice old fashioned masseuse. Is Lisa in the house? Oh, C, uh, don't go there. Uh, uh, he, C Brown is our resident young Earth creationist who pops in every once in a while. 
and uh, is and very, of course, very Steve sure Brown will right never acknowledge that he's wrong, no matter how much information is pushed his way, as young Earth creationists are wont to do. <laughs> anyway, the um, um, the climate issue material might as well dive into that because it's uh, it's an area that um, is methodologically parallel to creationism. Most anti-evolutionists will be climate science denialists because most of them come from a demographic where that kind of thing has been steeping for years, anti-environmentalism and all of that uh, from the Jerry Falwell era back in the 1970s. So it's not a new phenomenon. It runs parallel to uh, another demographic, which is the oil industry funded big business uh, chamber of commerce type uh, structure. Uh, and some of that will overlap in terms of that creationist demographic. So it, it's a funky little bit. Uh, on it. And you have uh, quite a few people in Congress, uh, um, Senator Inhofe and um, uh, Mike Pence and uh, uh, um, the governor of uh, Texas, uh, who became Dancing with the Stars and also the <laughs> energy secretary for a while under Trump, a strange revolving door. But it's it's a common element. You'll find uh, elements of it showing up in the Discovery Institute and other. Anyway, um, because uh, Jackson and I at some point will be doing a uh, book on uh, other areas of pseudoscience and science denial and the methodological approach to it and kind of the issues about some of them that are more important than others and climate denialism is one of those because it affects people's lives and the lives of future people because it's making decisions or preventing decisions to be made that uh, really matter in a way that flat earthers uh, and, and idiots posting on Nephilim uh, uh, in the Bible are relatively trivial and uh, don't really affect much of anything. Well, I happen to be bumping into uh, what you might call a, a gold mine uh, from this guy, Ned Nikolov, who was on Twitter. And um, he, uh, his argument is that there isn't re carbon dioxide doesn't really do anything bad and that it's all just due to the sun and so there is no it's all natural cycles and there's no actual uh, a human spurred global warming at all and he's done um two papers on this subject i uh, he's not really uh, a climate scientist he's a dilettante uh, who has uh, some degree in uh, an area unrelated to climate science so um, in other words he's pretending to be an authority on an authority yeah. subject which he has no authority over back in uh, he's appealing to he's making a false appeal to authority fallacy yeah and he has a a, a, a boisterous following uh on twitter but it's amusing because in 2014 he had done a paper under um a pseudonym uh, he had put a paper up in the Springer Plus Journal, which, by the way, is defunct. Uh, it uh, stopped uh, publishing in 2016. But this paper that he did there, and I put the links up in all of that to it because it's still posted. Um, he he inverted his name, ran it backwards, so he became Den Volokin, and um, the other uh, co-author uh, Zeller became Lark Relails, <laughs> and uh, uh, they were pretty much quickly outed for writing under pseudonyms at the time, the paper wasn't actually retracted. It's on the average temperature of airless spherical bodies and the magnitude of Earth's atmospheric thermal effect. And later they they um, uh, revamped uh, that paper and did a thing in the environmental the Environment Pollution and Climate Change Journal, which is a relatively minor uh, one, at least under their own names this time. And I put the link up to that. New insights on the physical nature of the atmospheric greenhouse effect deduced from an empirical planetary temperature model. Very, very nice title. Um, the fun part came in, in the back and forth that went on during the uh, Twitter. Uh, oh, Lisa asked, uh, have I heard of the hypothesis that HIV is somehow related to the Black Death? Uh, vaguely, I don't think I've gone. It's it's not what uh, it's not You're a kidding. Uh, it's not that kind of. We know the virus that's responsible for the Black Death. The only issue. It's not a are, virus. It's a bacterium. Uh, oh, which oh, means they yeah. cannot be related, or at least that, they, yes, because HIV is a is a virus. Um, we got uh, we got Jack. <laughs> Greetings. At, uh, yeah, and so uh, um, I, I had there a lot of subculture i haven't gone into all the little diseases in the world because there's usually a, a, a conspiracy for almost every one of them 
that somebody will claim that the CIA did it or um, space beings brought them down or something is going on. They're not the always night. wrong, though. Yeah, no, well, <laughs> well, the Andromeda strain, isn't that a documentary? Uh, or uh, what is it? Wasn't there, there was one where like the American government was te testing out uh, sterilization techniques on the city. Mm. That sounds sweet. Sounds like something the CIA would do on, on an off day when they have, anyway, welcome Jackson Wheat for those hey, people who, Jackson. Are not, who are not familiar with, uh, with Jackson. How you doing? Um, uh, I, I just went in with a very short, uh, intro on um, uh, the um, uh, Jensen book, and I'll give you a little precis of what I discovered. He starts off with a very mm. innocuous introduction and happens to mention uh, that uh, a lot of animals, foxes and bears, have uh, a pelt uh, color gradation as you move farther south, which is not a controversial point, mm -hmm. except the sources he cites for it don't discuss that. That they were just on like conservation issues for bears and uh, foxes and nice, perfectly fine material, but they're not about color gradations <laughs> in, uh, in those animals, let alone the dynamics and adaptive characteristics. So the very fact that he was launching into oh. a, a peripheral source for a technical point without actually offering a technical journal reference that actually refers to the point is boding w poorly for what we're going to be seeing in the rest of the book. <laughs> or, 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 alert, alert. We are detecting yeah. heavy amounts of creationism ahead. Well, and it, it's a sloppy method that we, as we document in the book that I waved in front Your of you earlier, screens. Um, that there's an awful lot of tendentious citation uh, that we've encountered amongst an awful lot of people where they're, they, they want to look sciencey. And if, and it, with their audience, they will be wowed by the fact that there's a reference. I noticed that that happened exactly with Dinesh D'Souza too, which is completely in another non-creationism area, that there were people who would be reading his book and they would think it is well-documented because he had footnotes. Not that they had checked out to see whether the footnotes justified the things he claimed from them, which is what well-documented would mean beyond that. And so that... Uh, uh, failure to check up on the references, uh, it, it's the onus on the reader. I mean, if they go to all the trouble of putting those little references up there, we can go to all the trouble of checking them out and finding out whether they are the um, the way that they are. So uh, I'm going to be I'm breaking this down the same way that I did uh, the Sanford uh, book, Rupi and Sanford's book, by um, whether they're technical citations or secondary citations, whether they're being used for authority quoting or not. Uh, whether they're creationist sources, which later on in the thing I notice he does actually uh, delve into a little bit. And of the technical citations, are they fair and square where they're cited correctly without exaggeration, whether they agree with them or not? Uh, are they being used for authority quoting or are they actually misrepresenting? And Ruby and Samford, as you may recall, uh, was hitting about a 50% misrepresentation rate on their technical literature. Uh, I'll be curious to see also whether it'll add up to a comparable amount of technical sources that Ruby and Sanford have, which read about, uh, well, the whole total number of sources was about 500 or so. And we'll find out how thick uh, it is in terms of documentation. I will find that out. And that's a measurement that then gives you a precise accounting of the understructure. It's like Look in the uh, underside of the car to find out whether it's rusty or not, or whether there's bolts Leave attached. Leave it to RJ, the source citation bloodhound. Yeah, well, yeah. And that's that's the main thing because um, every work that is legitimate and rigorous should be able to withstand a source analysis. And if they're making it hard for you to do source analysis by not given sources or um, being obtuse as how they deal with them, or using oddly inappropriate sources like we're discovering with that secondary material. Uh, you always go to your best game. Uh, when Jackson and I were writing Rocks Were There, we're not going for like what somebody writes on a blog necessarily, unless it's relevant because there's a controversy and you want to discuss that aspect. We want to try to dive it uh, and, and document it at a primary source level, ideally very up to date so that it's reflecting a current view of things. And when you don't do that, that's you have to wonder why, either because they didn't know about it or they didn't want you to know about it or some combination of the above.
And that, that's a dead giveaway on that. So we are going to be predicting that as we proceed through the book, it's going to be a pile of crap. And we will find out whether or not that will be a prediction that will be borne out, or will we be pleasantly surprised by- Let's hope it's the latter. It would be- Yeah, no. Yeah, it, it I, should be really interesting to see. If you were looking at the live chat, RJ, you would have seen that uh, when the uh, the guy on the uh, mo on movie day said, oh, the Earth is 6,000 years old. I, I was in the chat saying, I fucking knew it because I predicted earlier. Yeah, this guy's probably a yak. Oh, well, call me emo says Jackson. We'd have an argument on the Arctic fish antifreeze. I want a little help with. Oh boy, do we have an extensive oh, section of that in the book? <laughs> that's one that uh, there are no creationists who touch it. Casey Luskin tries very glance poorly. past it really yeah. fast in a sprint. It's, yeah, he says like, things like, "They don't talk about when this happened." Uh, excuse me, did you read the paper? Yes, it did. Um, yeah. uh, but creationists. Oh. Funny enough, uh, when I debated standing for truth, um, the only he he mentioned the Zoarcid antifreeze glycoprotein, and he mentioned it because it's the oh only gosh. one creationists have talked about because Georgia Purdom did. But the thing is, with the Zoarcid, they use that one as kind of an end run because they say, oh, it just basically amplified the effect. Yeah, it, is, it served their purpose to discuss that one. Yeah, which it, I would still say is new information, but even still, they don't discuss the notothenioids who repeatedly duplicated the trypsinogen gene and neofunctionalized it, or the boreogatus, which yeah. took a non-functional sequence and made it functional. There are different ways to talk. get to an antifreeze protein in different Jackson, organisms. That, that and there are different ways to bad. freeze a fish. Yeah. yeah, and the, and no coincidence that when fish that develop that will expand into northern waters in a way that fish that don't have that adaptation won't. So it the the, the, the fish that have they were uh, I think Cus Luskin, if memory serves me, was trying to imply that there was no incidence of those fish in non cold waters to imply that they had to have been designed in place. But in fact, th that was wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's. Yeah, it, which is is weird because for intelligent designers, if you're talking about you're talking about fish, or you're talking about just one group of fish, and presumably intelligent designers are okay with all fish being related to each other. So you know what's the problem with this one little group of fish <coughs> developing a a new set of proteins? Uh, it's just it's it's uh, like telescoping the issue. You know, we're okay with all this stuff, but this one little thing. No, we're going to take issue with that. Yeah, there, they can't be any evolution. It's <laughs> yeah. and that's kind of it. It's a slippery edge of the wedge. In their own way, they're just as recalcitrant as uh, uh, Kent Hovind is on the uh, contradictions in the Bible. That uh, if, if the intelligent design anti evolutionists can never really allow anything to be related to anything or anything of note to have developed by a purely natural means, because that undermines the, the, the defensive wall in the same way that that irreducible complexity com uh, concept starts being used really loosely to things that Behe didn't even argue that it applied to. So that you talk about the uh, 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 bladder warts uh, as uh, ir irreducibly complex uh, organisms. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it was funny that um, what's her name? O'Leary was waving uh, Venus flytraps when there are a number of papers discussing literally step by step by step how Venus flytraps and uh, other uh, carnivorous plants have evolved. Yeah, that was the stuff that I put in last week that I forgot to talk about because of my mouth rattled on a little too much and I've completely oh. forgot about it. I have to realize, you go, oh shit, I didn't discuss the damn bladder warts. So anyway, previous week, all of those sources were in there. Anyway, mm -hmm. um, uh, 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 just about, let me, let me thank uh, my patrons uh, there before we move on to uh, uh, Nikolev and the wonderful expanding earth balloon. Oh, you're going to love this, uh, Jackson. What? <laughs> Please don't <laughs> tell me that's actually something he said. Uh, yeah. You know anyway, I don't doubt uh, we got our colleagues, uh, Hendrel and Eric and Speed of Sound and Cirrus and Zeshi and our researchers, Travis and Convert and Eat and James and History Minor and Ralph and Apologia, Apologia. 
and assistant researchers Mike and Ian and Duranku and Ben Simpson and Tote Israel and our friends Daniel and Steve Bauman, they, geologist Bauman, Mary Gail Beddoes and Insects Are Cool and Devin and Morton and Paul the Skeptic and Puffalophagus and Bo and Alex and Paul. Just and give me the legacy. meteorology role, damn it. Yeah, and legacy patrons who uh, have helped at one time or another, but the circumstances change and, and coronavirus comes along and you got other expenses other than RJ to deal with. So uh, Jen and Jody and John and Keith and Andrew and Dyer and Yui and Mona and Brad and Daniel and Nyanya and Staggles and Sun and Ugly John and Jules and Everett and Sewer. Thank you all for all of the help that you have given all over this time. Now, um, this Nikolev guy I was jousting with on he had written a, a, a co-authored paper uh, and then revamped it under their own name finally. And along the way, one of the critics that was in this Twitter feed happened to bring up the fact that one of the mistakes he had made was to argue that the lunar temperatures, which he was using as a model for why the sun could produce all the heat we have and that CO2 has nothing whatsoever to do with it, that he got the chart wrong that he had misread the technical chart from this particular paper, which came oh. from um, this stuff from Vasavada, and I put the links up to that as well. Uh, he had done some work back in 1999 and then later uh, did follow-up work in 2012. And those were the two sources that were cited in uh, Nikolev's um, book or, or article uh, on this particular point. When I went and looked at the Vasavada paper, it was clear there were two curves involved, one of which involved sub sur surface temperature estimations, and then the surface temperature uh, bit, which was a way different curve. He had mistaken the subsurface one for the general temperature curve and just got the wrong curve in. When he was called on it, Nikolev did a Trump mode of digging his heels in because he refused to admit he'd made a mistake. And he insisted, oh, I didn't cite those papers. I didn't rely on those papers, but those are the ones in there. I didn't, I didn't rely, excuse me, what did you use then? That, that's the only data that you offered. The curve exactly matches the one that you had in the book, except you labeled it wrong and you misunderstood it. And he just dug in, dug in, dug in on this. So now I was having my little methods hooks in there because clearly we were seeing a Tortugan mind at work. And it was explaining why his work has not been greatly appreciated or influential in the regular scientific community. But it gets better <laughs> because at one better point, or worse. Well, that depends on how you want to look at it. Anyway, uh, let me see if I can find my little chart here. There we go. At one point, he um, put up a um, Nikolev uh, stuck up a reference thing to evolution of Earth's total atmospheric mass for the past 83 million years citing uh, Ned Nikolov, PhD 2020. And when you started diving into all this material, um, he uh, uh, talks about um, the idea that the mass, the, one of the experts he was relying on was this Maxlov guy who argues that the earth doesn't have any plate tectonics, that it's actually an expanding earth. Uh, uh, oh, Pangea yeah, that, yeah. was actually yeah. a smaller Earth that gradually is getting bigger over time. And I got to read you this thing from the Global Expansion Tectonics is 2012 thing that uh, I put the link to. You're going to love this. Uh, the current rate of increase in Earth radius is calculated to be 22 milliliters per year, millimeters per year. Extrapolation of radius to the future suggests that the Earth will increase to the size of Jupiter within approximately 500 million years. Drink! <laughs> and then the next paragraph was the one where I just lost it. Despite the enigmatic origin for the excess matter required for expansion, global geological and geophysical data quantify and sub substantiate and are key into recent Earth expansion process. Drink! <laughs> Despite the what did you say? The, the enigmatic origin for the excess matter required for this expanding Earth. <laughs> In other words, magic. magic. Making shit up. Violation of a I law mean, of thermodynamics? Uh, I mean, just among other things. <laughs> what? What geologic processes? Good question. If anyone can find any of that in any of Maxlau's writing, let me know. <laughs> I... 
I, I, I just, no. So there was, this was Nikolaev relying on Max Lau with a straight face, whether he even knew what his view was or not, but he was, he was throwing him up as this great, wonderful thinker that you should pay attention to. And I'm going, <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it explains why Nikolaev is a minor player. And I also put some links up to several, uh, critics of Nikolaev who have pointed out uh, you'll uh, this will come as a terrible shock that he was getting his numbers wrong. Whoa! <laughs> no, who would I know, have just, guessed? Who who could have thought? Who okay, could have thought? So let's just take into account that <laughs> if you increase the Earth's size, you either have to if you increase the Earth's volume, you have to either decrease the density or increase the mass. Mm -hmm. He has um, it expanding like a big balloon. And the, the detailed processes of which uh, elude his description anywhere in his writing so far that I could see. <laughs> if you increase the mass of the Earth by, while increasing its size so that you keep the same density, you're going to start dragging the moon into the Earth. Oh, yeah. You'd think that they no. would have detected no. that, that shifting of the of the cis lunar system by now. And also that you would have noticed this from like geopositioning satellites and all of that that can measure things down to a gnat's fart, uh, that they would have spotted that by now. Oh, and, this and on fellow top would of that, you're Nobel also Prize. going to have to increase the gravity of the planet. Yeah, which, you, of you, course, you, means man, it's going to be Edric. dragging things in towards it which would basically mean that earth would be the size of jupiter now correct me if i'm wrong does the mass of the orbiting body like say the earth get if it gets altered will it affect its orbit around the sun or yeah will just well it yeah will? it would have a different wouldn't it have a different pull on the other celestial bodies around it yeah so that, that would affect it's it. yeah. all uber me measurable and indeed uh, but but the, the oh, other idea yes. is that that it, it's like somebody couldn't get past uh, Wegener's version of continental drift from 1912 and didn't really understand it much so that they could just kind of shuffle these little continents around and seriously think that the Earth could be that much smaller. This is as bad as the Toscanelli map that Columbus was used for to, to come to America where they just removed With the little all that nipple on ocean. top. Hmm? With the little nipple on top. Uh, well, to make, that may be that separate case, but at any rate, yeah, Toscanelli's globe that um, uh, that um, the Columbus used to sell the Spanish on three thousand miles to China. <laughs> that's that, that that's that's that doesn't make any gosh dang sense. It's like <laughs> expecting the Earth to expand with absolutely no mechanism for how that mass could, you know, come work the. It's like asking, where does the matter come from? Yeah, this this one would have to be ranked with that with the great pseudoscience head up ass notions of the past, which would be the hollow earth or homeopathy. The, the, damn it. Well, yeah, yeah, <laughs> we're, because we're, the last time I ran the numbers for a single step dilution of. And a body or a single step dilution for a thing of 100 c the end result was a black hole that was bigger than the entire observable universe <laughs> i oh. noticed that that happens a lot whenever i calculate <laughs> loop scenarios for the cometary impact of the flood it was a planet cracker for the homeopathy in a for a 100 c dilution in a single step it was black hole that swallows the entire fucking universe and for bruce lipton it was a new mini Big Bang. For those of you who don't know what I mean when I say Bruce Lipton's mini Big Bang, I had actually run the numbers on just how freaking devastating a human using a yield, the entire energy content in their body for healing. I actually calculated how dangerous that would be to the planet. And well, let's just say it was not good. It was not good at all. It ended up with a calculated yield of one billion, or I think it was one trillion kilotons. Kind of the same reason why why uh, cold fusion had some snags because you know if it was really doing that, you'd expect to see more happening. 
especially fast neutrons. And they could never quite get past that part. But anyway, yeah, uh, it, it was kind of an interesting experience to discover a, a brand new subcategory of stupid. Uh, and because I had not encountered anyone quite like this. Apparently it was a novel notion that he was coming up with. Uh, oh, he published this, by the way, in the Proceedings of the NPA, which is the Natural Philos Philosophy Association, which apparently is like himself. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> An association of one. Yeah, yeah, it makes it so much easier. Yeah, uh, uh, little, little did we know that we could just set up an association and we could just call ourselves that and then we publish a thing. But remember uh, our, our uh, Lee and company and their uh, paper from the Canadian Journal of Anthropology. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, for those who haven't gotten um, rocks, we allude along the way to a, a, an obscure datum uh, about Lee, who um, is often cited um, as if it's a normal science source by an awful lot of anti-evolutionists on supposed dating problems with uh, um, hominid fossils. And I was looking around to try to find it online and it was never visible anywhere. And uh, I was kind of giving up hope on it. And then I, I just happenstance, I decided to check the Eastern Library, Eastern Washington University. And there it was in their catalog, hard copy. I go, what? The Canadian Journal of Anthropology, they carried it, wow. And I go down there and I still don't know why they carried it because it's not a normal magazine. It's a mimeograph screed that were put out by a couple of Canadians who were basically obsessed with the idea that the Vikings discovered America ahead of Columbus and therefore they were they didn't like the Italians. And it was it, it's an odd bunch. Well, and along the way, Along the way, this guy who had no experience or expertise or credentials to be able to venture an opinion on radiometric <coughs> dating at all. <laughs> and that it's not a normal journal, but it, it pops up not constantly, but and particularly in older creationist print books. Uh, if, so if you ever see the Canadian Journal of Anthropology, go. He, uh, well, I mean, to be fair, Leaf. Uh, was it Leif Erikson and his guys were there for like, what, a couple of years? And then oh, they yeah, they, they, they were, yeah. Well, there were Viking settlements at Lancet Meadow um, in uh, Newfoundland. Uh, that, yeah, they, um, they, they fucked on... off pretty quickly because the natives were too vicious for them. Well, th they stayed for a while and it's kind of interesting what uh, people are fascinated about it and how, how permanent the settlements were. What really screwed them up eventually was the temperature cooling in the 1300s. So they were just, un it was untenable for them to stay there. And um, they also weren't terribly good farmers. They were trying to take the farming practices that they used back in Norway and adapt them to a climate that wasn't really suited for it. So that was another part of their problem. And so they, they were in really bad times towards the tail end because they have their bodies that they found in burial sites and others to where it was clear they were like relying on fishing, which Norse don't really like doing at that stage. Yeah. So uh, there was a whole bunch of things. There have been a lot of technical literature on it anyway. So uh, yeah, the Norse did cover their, discover uh, America ahead of Columbus. They just didn't do anything with it. And, and the problem with Columbus is that he did far too much with it. So <laughs> to the annoyance of the natives, but- um, He said, achoo, nice to meet you. <laughs> yeah, just about. <laughs> Um, I'm always intrigued. Oh boy, this is a digression. Um, I'm always uh -oh. intrigued by um, uh, transoceanic uh, settlements in antiquity or not. Uh, there is a certain amount. The Phoenicians, who were very probably the oddball leftovers of what was left over from the Minoan culture, uh, the Phoenicians who eventually settled Carthage, they sail all over places and probably had connections in trade to the tin mines of Britain. And this goes quite a ways back. And so I don't know, my whole... dealer won't tell me where he gets it. Mm. <laughs> yes, yes. And uh, uh, so there's a whole interlocking network of things. Uh, some tend to go a little overboard. Uh, there's the ones who argue that uh, the Chinese discovered America in uh, the uh, Middle Ages, 12, 13, 1400 period. Uh, that's problematic. Uh, you've got probable instances of various people, sailors blown astray and crashing on a shore uh, and involving things. But there's a small body of people who are arguing that there was a big uh, settlement of uh, uh, Mali 
Africans in the New World uh, back in the 11 or 1200s. That's very fairly there, problematic. There wouldn't have um, been any natives there if there had been. Yeah, and it, to some extent, it it's a bit of the old cliche that, oh gosh, we can't let the Native Americans actually do all of that stuff. We've got to have other people come and do that for them because they can't do it on themselves. Yeah. So there's, an, there's if, a great deal of racism to it. If it wasn't white people, it was aliens. Yeah, or well, in the case of this Mali bit, it would have been blacks. Uh, yeah. And, and th there actually was a maritime empire there. So it's not implausible to imagine something going on, but it, it's, it's unless they can find better genetic information on it and archeological finds it's in the interesting, but probably not established yet, the clue. I, I, and I never un underestimate that another area is the whole settlement of the Polynesians. And there we now know they, the, their spectacular ability to, to, to sail extremely long distances uh, with just using a, a very great understanding of, of the oceans and where stars were and all this stuff for navigation, uh, that um, amazing cultures. Uh, some who I'd like to have done stuff, you know, uh, we've got um, the Egyptians uh, and uh, their uh, seagoing vessels. The, Ch the Chinese did have uh, invented a hell of they invented the rudder, uh, the keel yep. rudder and all of that com magnetic if, compasses. <laughs> if the Chinese really wanted to, they probably could have gone to America. They just well, didn't there's always bother. the uh, oh, in that direction. The problem are a lot of the, the, the way the trade winds went and often it went in the wrong direction. Uh, for people to be able to explore some yep. of these things. And then the other factor with the Chinese is they were just so insular. They thought, well, we've invented everything. Nothing outside of our world is of any good at all. We don't even need you at all. So poop, and we'll build a wall and we'll pretend you aren't there. And yeah, then, big uh, surprise. The Japanese uh, adopted familiar. guns quicker. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and the, um, the, the use of gunpowder that spread, uh, uh, the Chinese knew how to make rockets and, and weaponry out of it. They just tended not to, uh, and uh, which you can argue is kind of benign, but eventually the, uh, the Turks picked it up and uh, they started blasting away at Europeans as they were expanding their empire and the Europeans picked it up because they were being blasted away by the Turks. And then eventually they were putting them on their ships and then they were sailing back in and bumping into the Chinese with their guns and telling them, hey, buy this opium. Oh, RJ, I, I, uh, since we're already on this tangent, uh, <laughs> the chapter in history that I had to read today was the lead up to the War of 1812 Ooh. and the... It was like um, Jeffersonian presidency and the first Madison presidency. Yeah, it, interesting so, period. A, a, a war that is built upon um, bad communication in part and uh, the fact that that inadvertently be a, a, a thought experiment on what if, if there had been a transatlantic cable in 1810 instead of 1860, Andrew Jackson might never have been president. Because uh, the uh, a war of eighteen twelve, we lost every bloody battle. Remember, they burned Washington. Well, that was and, under Madison's presidency. Yeah, well, yeah, but but the point is, Jackson won the Battle of New Orleans that yes. defeated the British, a battle that was fought after the peace treaty had been oh. signed, but nobody oh, yeah, knew yeah. it because there was no transatlantic cable. So if they yeah. had had communications at that speed, there would have been no Battle of New Orleans. There would have been right. no Andrew Jackson hero of New Orleans. Right. And so he might have just ended up a slave holding fart of no consequence. There might have still have been the back the bank of the United States. There might never have been a depression of 1830. Who knows what might have happened? The Cherokees might still the Cherokee be in, might not in, have gone in North Carolina. Over? Yeah, it was, um, it was kind of interesting because it seemed... All the steel the, in the United the States. The way the... Yeah, they, uh, well, Jefferson had also gone hard on uh, the manufacturing industries during his presidency as well. But um, it yeah. kind of seemed interesting that the way the textbook portrayed it was that the war was more or less inevitable, that we kind of kept getting screwed over by both France and England. Oh, and so yeah, because we were we were caught up as the foam on the beer between the, the uh, Napoleonic Empire and the British. And the British were saying, excuse me, we want a blockade and how dare you trade with the French and right. we, a, a nation of incipient smugglers uh, uh, just loved to do that and hated to get involved, uh, to be told what we couldn't do. So yeah, mm -hmm. th as we were flexing our muscles, we were, and we were also gradually uh, bumping in, in the next years uh, with, um, uh, there was a bunch of Americans who really would like to have Canada. 
So there was a lot yeah, of them that we'd uh, like to have def- uh, conquered Canada during the uh, War of 1812. We were the, still, uh, yeah, we were still grappling with the British all the way down into the 1840s and 50s, uh, where I live out here, Oregon Territory. Uh, there was a bunch that wanted it to be 54, 40 or fight uh, in the 1840s. They wanted the boundary layer of the Oregon Territory to be basically British Columbia. <laughs> and yep. we eventually signed a treaty with the British that divvied the line across with a little burp uh, at the coast. <laughs> yeah, it seemed like um, yeah. the, the, what is it? the Because you had the, the Federalists had, had kind of gone out, though they got a little bit of a surge, but they also got put down again uh as the as the uh the war Weeks. was coming yeah and the way yeah, the, the the federalists uh it's an interesting things about everyone has to be careful about the political labels that were used because they're not quite what we're used to now uh mm-hmm. the democratic party that we kind of know is really partly jackson's construction because it had been the democrat republican thing under right. Uh, 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 Jefferson. Jefferson, Jefferson yeah. could be thought of as the liberal expansionist international side and largely agrarian farmers and mm-hmm. not really businessy sorts, right. whereas the Federalists were the banking interests That's and Hamilton, your yeah. Alexander Hamilton style, let's have public improvements and do Erie canals and all sorts of stuff and um, a dis- detestation for banks runs straight through those Democrat Republicans uh, in that period, that Jefferson Mm -hmm. didn't like banks. Farmers don't like banks. They don't like to have to owe money to banks, whereas bankers just love to lend money out. And so the the Hydra of uh, Chestnut Street, uh, the Bank of uh, uh, the United States, which was a kind of semi-private concern that was run by the Biddle family, pretty much. Uh, And that was the thing. They functioned like a Federal Reserve. And it helps stabilize the economy. And of course, the farmers didn't like that. And Jefferson uh, Jackson didn't like that. And he, in one of the momentous decisions of his very busy administration uh, in the 1830s, uh, pulled the plug on the Bank of the United States. He vetoed, the, the Congress had re, um, uh, reauthorized it, but he vetoed it. And they didn't have the votes to overrun it. So the Bank of the United States disappeared. And surprise, surprise, there would be periodic depressions about every 25 years in the United States all through the 19th century until they created the Federal Reserve. <laughs> Whoops. Whoops. Yeah. In fact, the first one he immediately hit his successor. Uh, the, the depression of the 1830s screwed up poor Martin Van Buren's term. He was the, the little vice president under Jackson, and he was looking forward to um, four more years of progress. And oops. <laughs> and so you had um, the Whigs, of course, were somewhat hampered by the fact that they tended to drop dead in office. Uh, that kind of slowed them down a bit. So uh, two, the two presidents who died in office during that period were both Whigs. Yeah. And um, they, they were also the ones bunch. who were like um, a- anti war of 1812 right uh, it, there was a there was a legitimate divide about whether or not you wanted to go to war with england there were a lot of anglophiles in the federalists who uh, uh wanted to maintain peace we can negotiate with them and all of that and and um you, you have you, there's a certain amount of flexing arrogance about the, the democrat republicans basically it's saying well f you we're gonna do it and uh, um, the, the United American States. American attitude. Yeah, well, and it, it, it was <laughs> tremendously expansionist. And the United States went from uh, oh, the former colonies to the Colossus by 1900, uh, where uh, we started to be a not debtor nation anymore. And uh, we were yeah. uh, building canals and, and have, uh, building a big Navy and starting to strut onto the scene and inventing airplanes and automobiles and electric lights and telephones and, <laughs> and, 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 you know, so it, it, a lot and of things we were going set on. Japan up the bomb. <laughs> well, the, yeah, that, um, um a long thing the, the Japanese, there's another expansionist power, uh, that, uh, modernized in a hurry. Those who of you who have read my novel, the paralogues of Phileas Fogg, will get a little tasting when he's in Yokohama of uh, some of the uh, Meiji uh, attitudes about things, their early militarism stage. They copied the American U- uh, military. When the Japanese uh, revised their armies under the Meiji, they copied the, the Union uniforms. So all their uniforms are blue, uh, federal yeah. blue. Yep. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yeah, well. yeah. 
They were despite they were the rapidly... fact that we dropped a bomb on them. Hey, we got to learn oh, to no, love the that, bomb. That's well, that's quite a ways later, you know. That's, that's quite a ways later. As 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 a character says in 1873 in my novel, no one will ever uh, uh, um, expect uh, Nagasaki to be known for anything violent. <laughs> Nobody um, will ever expect <laughs> Nagasaki to be known for anything violent. Remember, had we not stuck our fingers in Japan for the purposes of business, ooh, Japan probably wouldn't have been a major uh, power in World well, War II. Well, it's hard to say. It's really hard to say where Japan might have gone. Uh, there, there were so many different powers bumping into them. We jump-started it by just ramp landing a boat there and saying, excuse me, we're here. Uh, in the 1850s. As the Americans do. Um, and the Japanese had gone through, they had a, oh boy, this is a digression from science, I'm sorry. <laughs> but the... Um, it's a useful digression from science. Yeah, the, the, the shogun, the shogunate had been disintegrating and they were in a, a, a big problem over the samurai. And in fact, um, even all through the 1870s and the 1880s, the, the Meiji imperial government had problems with uh, ex-samurais and they had uprisings and a whole bunch of things. And yep. so I think that movie that uh, Tom Cruise made is sort of about that period um, in the 1860s and 70s when the Japanese were were militarizing and yeah. and were were uh, developing under the new empire, uh, the emperor, uh, where they were making use of religion. Shinto as a religion became a state religion because it was emperor worship and all that. So there was the use of religion and politics altogether. But everybody underestimated the Japanese. I mean, they went from a culture known for really interesting art and rice paper and beautiful poetry and cute little things and nothing much other than that to a formidable power. It, in uh, split, the yeah. Russians underestimated them in 1905 and got there. Were not one, but two. Yeah. Both of the Russian navies got sunk by the Japanese during the Russo-Japanese War, the one in the Pacific, and then the one that went all the way around the horn in that and came up. And and there and the Japanese sunk that too, and so there was a gigantic yeah, naval that, contract that, that went big out. Big surprise! After island nations like big navies. Yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, they're, Hold they're, on, they're, I I get I have to say this since they like big navies. Does that mean that island nations like big boats and they cannot lie? Oh God damn it! Boo! <laughs> I say boo. Yeah, you. Boo, <laughs> but yes, uh, um, as we all know, uh, island nations have this eerie tendency to make use of navies for some. Odd I reason. wonder why. <laughs> wonder why? Yes. <laughs> when when you but, think yeah. about it, aren't all continents just islands? Yes, big islands, great, great, great big islands. Until they, until like, they well, even is a continent, anyways. Yeah. Anyway, Under that's my definition, um, it's a place. Boy, that's a that, that's a, a historical a digression plate. from where we were talking about stupid climate scientists and an expanding Earth. I I, I I still have to boggle at the thought of anybody in the 21st century seriously trying to argue based on all the information that we have accumulated on the way the continents and the land masses and the mantle and all of it stuff work to where there's such an interlocking mass of scientists to come in like a cartoon and argue that the Jurassic world actually was just one big lump. <laughs> well, RJ creationism, but I rest. Well, I don't know that this guy is a creationist. I can't find out anything about his background other than this weird, stupid belief that he has. He doesn't seem to link up with other uh, viewpoints and and so he's operating in a little side niche uh if anybody has some additional information on on uh, max lau uh let me know because uh, that could be um an, an interesting bit that uh, some people will maintain a kind of closet weirdness and then later on it pops out we alluded to a few of those uh, ones the geocentrists and some you know anti-semitic crackpots and all that stuff that lurk around in the, in the little corners of creationism and then this may be one of them but at the very least he's popping up in this uh, climate science denialism thing <laughs> yipes so uh is everybody keeping safe how is things going with the school and lockdowns and all that things crap? are relatively quiet um, here i'm i'm pretty fine here or at least I should say here in Citrus County, Florida itself is going to shit. Hmm. Things are stable here in Spokane. People are going out when we need to. But other than that, we're kind of staying hunkered down. Uh, and uh, I got to go, as I say, to the store tomorrow to pick up some milk so I can put on my cereal because I'm now out of out of uh, uh, the. Um, uh, well, I still just... have to. 
I still have uh, you know, all my online classes and also work. So fun times. Yep. Uh, yeah. Well, it keeps us busy. Um, eventually, I, I guesstimate sometime by May or June, I should be resuming my chapters for Rocks Volume 2. Oh, and I'm collecting any of the upcoming information that we want to put into uh, uh, any of the, the updates, we'll just stick in an appendix. So there'll be an appendix four that will relate to updates for um, uh, stuff that came up rel relevant to stuff we brought up in volume one that we can well, see. I was thinking two. we could put some of that in the first chapter. Uh, yeah, for, for uh, um, primary elements, but there may be some little things that, that are that we would have put in to the book that aren't necessarily topics that were in oh, the material well, anyway, that we can slip that in to an appendix. Because that kind of reminds me of the, um, of the ancestor, not the ancestor, uh, the selfish gene, the 40th, whatever edition, mm -hmm. uh, 40th anniversary. Uh, he has like end notes, these long end notes about, um, he's like, oh, well, I asked somebody 30 years ago to look into this and they haven't done it yet. <laughs> stuff like that <laughs> or you know a digression about like aphids or something like that so yeah that's always um a, a general rule that both uh, jackson and i make use of in our various activities is a uh, follow-up that if a topic comes up find out what's been written on it now if there's oh. nothing written on it now you have to oh. ask why not if it's an old topic is there a reason why it's an old topic? Because it never went anywhere. So somebody can come up, you know, with a, with a, a, a hypothesis that somebody will be waving at you from 1980. And if nothing's happened on it in the decade since, that's probably a clue that there was no there there. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. So always look at the dates of material. In some, sometimes some things are um, uh, seminal work that will be alluded to just because it really got the ball rolling and they move way, way beyond it. Uh, but in other cases, they're hard problems to deal with uh, and you don't necessarily find that out until you dive deeper. Um, remember that most of the journals that are available, uh, that will be available in some form or another online, either in abstract or full text. So you'll probably be able to track down at lickety speed um, the follow-ups on that using Google Scholar and the various other, and Wikipedia for that matter, uh, as kind of an entry door for a lot of that stuff. It can save you a lot of time. I mean, that, that um, you don't have to worry about camping out at the library and working your way through the, the journals from A to Z. That, that is not, no, that ain't going to work. That, that's not going to happen. There is an entire journal on, on uh, memories, as RJ and I discovered memories and they have to know <laughs> <laughs> yeah we uh we were looking up the thing about uh the the platypus or uh, monitoring yeah. uh lactation and we found out yeah there's an entire journal on memories How oh and that? there will be journals uh, um, we don't bump into them an enormous amount because we're not writing a treatise on diseases but virtually every disease or malfunction will have its own dedicated journal <laughs> that's where they publish yeah. in that and, and some um uh model species have their own uh, journals like euglena yeah, yeah they just have I, I, a whole journal just on euglena research yeah we're the all journal get together they, they have little action figures and they do little parties and <laughs> yeah there probably is a there's probably a, like a drosophila journal and uh yeah. and probably like a, a zebrafish well uh, Ar aridopsis any of those that are model ones that are that are, are the primary uh, fields in there then everybody wants to be able to share all the information on that. Uh, and most of them, if they're biological and they have any interconnection with diseases at all, the, the advantage is that virtually all of those will be open access because they want that information out there because people in the field need to gain access to it. So the ones that are going to be the toughest will be the obscure journals uh, in like paleontology and geology where they're still kind of based on subscription to be able to get by. So they have a firewall on them. Science Magazine is still a firewall journal, although some elements of it are open access. Nature is the same way. Uh, and um, the, But the biological journals are often bankrolled by lots of big foundations, and so they can afford to have the thing open access, and they want to get that out of the way. So anyway, uh, any final uh, um, thoughts here? Because we've been at this little hour in here. Uh, old, old Scratch says, haven't seen Red Dwarf. Where can I watch that? I saw when it was on PBS television years ago, and I think cable or on-demands 
still do that. In fact, uh, my um, uh, uh, niece's husband uh, had become a big Red Dwarf fan, so they they were kind of watching those. It's uh, yeah, Yada Rimmer World. Uh, the, the actor uh, that plays Rimmer in uh, Red Dwarf popped up in the oddest of places on a murder mystery where I was, and he's much older now, and I'm going to the left shit. corner. Yeah, it pops that up though. So anyway, yeah, um, uh, if if you like quirky um, period comedy, uh, that's uh, and you and to find out what smeghead means and all of that, then yes, this would be. I need to use the restroom, and this is probably where I'm going to end the. Chat yes, because... yes, we need to end anyway, but we're yeah. past the hour on this. Uh, if Mel, if you are um, uh, there, she had to step away from the computer. If not, we'll. Bye. Do the... Oh, Bye. I I I have a fun little oh. nitpicky thing. I, I really um, have to go. So regarding. Uh, bye bye. Whenever Bye-bye. I hear anybody mention uh, Continental Drift, I have to automatically go, uh, that's not a Fury, and it's only mildly related to plate tectonics as an inspiration. Yeah, it's although I will use Continental Drift, and it'll it'll pop up in, in general descriptions of it. But yeah, the, the whole term you, you, implies you drift that. as in something kind of floating along like a turd on your toilet bowl, and, and that RJ, ain't going to work. There are... There are so many so other many things. analogies I could have. There picked. are so many, and you had to pick that one. <laughs> you know, we and, could have and, said like like a cherry in a drink or something. No, a turn. no, no. I had to go it. Yeah. Oh, my God. oh, oh. History Miner says that they can't get our book rocks uh, through Amazon in Canada. Well, that's not nice. What? Why not? They won't. They won't ship to a Canadian address. Because we, we've you had people. Canada. <laughs> we've had people in England. Uh, who yeah. bought our book? Well, so. Christine Janice bought uh, my book uh, um, from them from England. So, kind of poke around on that and see, what, or for that matter, go to your bookstore and see if they can kind of end run it that way. Yeah. Morton Nielsen, oh, help you. Uh, one of my patrons, yes. Uh, bye, people. Uh, thanks, RJ. Thank you, Morton. Yeah. So, if, anyway, if you can't um, get it uh, physical copy in uh, Canada, you might have to go through ebook. Yeah. Then, and, and you may find far, you can be able to order from it the distribution through center. They might just the, not bother your local bookstore on that, that they may be able to end run it that way. Because we, we for no reason other than just our, our civic spiritedness, we want everyone on the planet to have a copy of the book. So. <laughs> Put them in a cannon and shoot them at Ken Ham. Yeah, yeah, right. along with the uh, volcanic uh, koala Fire bears. upon the ark! <laughs> anyway, uh, so I guess that'll do for another week, Scientist Mel. Uh, you may shut us down. And uh, we, we digressed a hell of a lot on the War of 1812. <laughs> it's quite all right. See you guys next time. Yep. Uh, and thank you again, Mel. Thanks, Mel. Thanks. Bye. Phenomena. Do, 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 do. Uh,